Our guest today is founder and CEO of Love Shouldn't Hurt, a group dedicated to casting a light on domestic violence. She's also been featured many times in the media, including Bronx News 12, and she also has received a number of different accolades, seven this year alone. So I am pleased to welcome Melissa Holmes to our stage. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yes. No, I mean, I really was inspired by your story. I mean, you're not just helping domestic violence survivors, you're also one yourself. So describe to us, when was the first time you realized that you were being abused? Well, it was actually, oh, I would say in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually, uh, that my husband is actually my first abuser. Mm. And at the time, I really didn't realize that it was abuse because in my house growing up as a child, we was always taught that whatever happens in your house stays in your house and the man is always supposed to be the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of things that were taking place then that I didn't connect the dots and realize that it was a form of abuse until it had actually taken a turn for the worse, I would say. Things started to get out of hand somewhere something shifted mm -hmm. and I wasn't aware of exactly where it shifted. Right. Um, I started to see this different person, a person that I didn't know. Right, right. You said y'all court you courted for five years and everything was fine and then looking back now though, do you see there there were signs? No. You know, I act I, I go over this periodically in my head because I get that question a lot. Oh, you had to have seen signs. There were no signs mm. from my husband. Yes, we courted, we dated for five and a half years before we actually got married. Mm -hmm. And in that five and a half years, I had never he had never raised a voice. Wow. He had never gotten upset. He wasn't a drinker. We would go out, you know, dancing. He would have a drink or two, mm -hmm. but that would that was it. So no trying to like take you away from your friends and your family and control you. Nothing like no, that. No, he actually wanted to be around my family. When I got married, we actually moved in the same building as my sister, my mother's sister, my aunt, my mother. We were all in the same building. So it was a, I guess you would say a family oriented building because I had my oldest sister on the second floor. I had my aunt on the first floor. My mother lived on the fourth floor and we were right over my mother on the fifth floor. Wow. So it was never that he tried to isolate me mm -hmm. or anything like that. When I saw things started to shift was when we actually got married. Mm -hmm. It was like the minute I said I do, mm -hmm. he started to become obsessive, real possessive, That's and strange. I couldn't understand like right. what happened mm -hmm. in that short of time that would yeah. make him do this whole 360. It was puzzling. Right. And so before things had actually started to get bad, when I realized something wasn't right, I had mentioned to him, I think maybe you should go and you should stay with your mom for a right, minute yeah, because yeah. I was feeling some kind of way and mm -hmm. I needed to figure out what was going on. At that point, he had started, you know, I felt smothered, mm -hmm. in other words, right. and he refused to leave. Mm. The thing was, both of our names are on the lease. I don't see why I should have to leave. But had he started like laying hands on you at that point or just being verbally abusive and doing those types of things? Yeah. It okay. started out verbal mm -hmm. for little things he would argue. Um, you know, we worked different shifts. Mm -hmm. So I worked a nine to five and he would sometimes work the graveyard shift or he would work from four to 12. Mm -hmm. So we missed each other in the house a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And then if he did doubles, he did overnights because he worked in a group home, that means I'm home with the kids right. the majority of the time. So I'm picking up the kids from my moms when they come home from school, I'm doing the cooking, I'm doing the homework, I'm doing everything. And so it was a lot of times that he, weren't, he wasn't there, he wasn't present. Right. So I had to play both roles. And I noticed that I would come home and he would, just little things he would start arguing about. 
Like he would call and ask if I cook. And I would tell him, yes, you right. know, yeah, I cooked. Okay. Okay. You get off at 12 o'clock. By the time he would get home, I would be asleep. I would fix him a plate and I would put it in the microwave. All he had to do was warm it up. To, was warm it up. Mm -hmm. He would come in. He would get home about 1, 1 30, And there was an argument about the food. He would come in there and wake me up. Oh, my goodness. And he would start arguing for like two hours. I have to be up at 6. I'm up right. With for like him, two hours arguing, arguing about right. some food. And I started to say, it's got to be more that's going on other than you arguing about some food. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed he just started to do other little things that like really start to creep me out. For example? He started to have me follow. Oh my God. Wow. Um, there was times things had gotten really bad mm -hmm. and I had started to go out mm -hmm. just to get away from what was going on in the house. Right. And so I started, whereas though I was in the house on the weekend, I decided that I wanted to go out mm -hmm. and I would go and I would hang out with the girlfriends. So there was a lot of times that I would admit that I may have done things purposely because I didn't want to be in the house with the argument. Right. So I would stay out mm -hmm. till like five, six o'clock sometimes. The sun was coming up and what he would call was inappropriate. And so I would come in and he would just start arguing. And so I would turn around and do it again the next week. <laughs> next week and on and on. And it just, yeah, way. and it just progressed. And then I think when I stopped going out, but there was no communication between him and I. Mm -hmm. At that time, I think I had realized like, mm. Mm -hmm. you know, like this is not what I signed up for. Right. And so then I started to question a lot of things because... You started to become aware that aware. this was not the way that the relationship Absolutely. was supposed to go. Absolutely. Because so. I started to form my own opinion about what I thought. And although my mom was like, well, you know, that's your husband. Yeah. You're supposed to whatever... In other words, whatever he says or whatever she feel, you stick it out. Right. But right. then I that started to... Think yeah. that this oh, is not what I want, and so he he actually passed away. You said he passed away, and that's how that relationship ended. Yes, and then and then what happened? He passed away in two thousand and three from mm -hmm. an asthma attack. Oh wow! And after he passed away, my son and I we went through our grieving period, and we went to counseling. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like I didn't want to be in New York anymore. Okay. And I wanted to start over someplace new because I felt like there was too many memories here that I just wanted to just leave behind. Right, right. And so I stayed single for mm -hmm. about three years. Okay. <laughs> and the next relationship I got into after those three years mm -hmm. was, a, was another abusive relationship. Wow. Wow, I'm... I can't imagine. I mean, you've coming from one where the guy was verbally abusive to you, maybe occasionally physically abusive, and now you're in this next relationship. And what, describe the first time he became violent towards you, and what was going through your mind? The first time, I think from being verbally abusive, mm -hmm. I had become real sensitive to when you start raising your voice. Right. That was a trigger for me. So when the second abuser would start to raise his voice, automatically my antennas would go up because I'm saying, mm-mm. Right, I don't like this. Yeah, I started to feel very uncomfortable because I knew mm -hmm. how my husband had got, when, so I'm saying, no. Not again. Not right. again. Right. And then... I think I maybe I would say, I guess it's fair to say that I tried to brush it off mm -hmm. or I didn't want to believe that he was an abuser. Mm -hmm. Just coming out of an abusive relationship, I, it, it was just so hard to grasp like, is this real? Right, right. 
And so, and again, your family too. Your mom was telling you that the the voices you were hearing from her was like, you know, go along with it. You know, this is okay. Man is in charge, and all those things. I'm sure it wasn't helping you to kind of break free. Well, no, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, because actually, and with my husband's, you know, although I didn't say anything, there was times that I did try to tell them without, you know, I tried to give them hints without actually saying what was going on. And sadly to say that nobody believed me. Mm -hmm. So when I got into this second abusive relationship, I hid it. They made it real easy for me to hide it, in other words, because they didn't believe me with the first one. Right. So, in my head, I'm saying, okay, well, if I come and I tell you about this one, and he actually almost killed me, mm. what makes me think that you're going to believe me about this one? You didn't believe me about my husband. Right. So, I didn't say anything. Right. And I hid it. Yeah. So, I learned how to master it. Mm -hmm. So, I knew that once I left my house and I lock the door I become just like every other person leaving out in the morning going to work wow. I'm pulled together I put on this mask mm -hmm. and then I know when it's time for me to go back home I'm that sad Melissa I know what's waiting for me on the other side of that door no you talked about that a lot too you talked about how even with your abuser you know there was a certain way you had to carry yourself because you didn't want him to see you cry you didn't want him to he would, it would make it worse in a way. Yeah, because he didn't, it didn't phase him. Where is though most people, if someone sees someone cry, you try to console them, you know, or if they did something to you, at least they would apologize, I'm sorry, or whatever. Tears didn't phase him. Mm -hmm. So he right. would look and he, you know, he would make little muscle. You can stop crying. Because those tears don't phase me. Wow. Wow. And so, I had to pull myself together to figure him out. Mm -hmm. In other words, I had to learn to be a step ahead of him and know how he would think. So, I got to the point that although I was hurt and he would hit me, I wouldn't cry in front of him. Right. I wouldn't give him, I got to the point that I wouldn't give him the satisfaction because I start to realize that at some point he was waiting for me to now cry. Right. So I had to go in the bathroom and give myself a pep talk. Wow. In the mirror. And I would go in the bathroom and I would cry to myself and I would look in the mirror and I would wipe my tears and I would say I would put some water on my face and I would say Melissa you're going to get it together. You're going to grow some tough skin. Because if not, he's going to kill you. Well, talk about that. Because you, you said there was a real pivotal moment when he abused you. And that's when you decided, you know what? I've got to get out of this. Can you describe that? Absolutely. I remember, I don't remember exactly what we were arguing about. He had come home from work and he had just started arguing. And I remember saying to him, listen, not today. I'm not in the mood. I don't want to hear this. Right. So I walked away from him and I went in the bathroom and I locked the bathroom door. And I just pulled the toilet seat down and I'm sitting on the toilet mm -hmm. and I'm just thinking to myself, God, you got to be kidding me. Right. Like I couldn't believe. You hear again? Mm -hmm. And so, at that moment, he is standing at the bathroom door, mm -hmm. and he's shaking the knob, and he's telling me to open the door. And I'm telling him, no, I'm not going to open the door because I knew what was going to happen right, when if I up. open that yeah. door. Right. And so, I said to him, no, I'm not opening the door. Mm -hmm. And he's steady trying to convince me to open the door. Mm -hmm. At some point, it happened so fast, he had kicked the bathroom door in. Oh my gosh. And he came in the bathroom charging at me while I'm sitting on the toilet. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed me around my throat. Mm -hmm. And he was choking me. 
and he had my head leaned back like this and he had his two thumbs pressed up against my windpipe wow. choking me with full force wow. he was choking me so hard that tears mm -hmm. like I just had no control right. over the tears falling from my face right. and he's looking down in my face as the tears are rolling out my face and I just remember reaching up at his face like trying to scratch his face like I couldn't even talk like he was choking me so hard I couldn't even form any words to come out of my mouth yeah, he was killing you and he looked down in my face and he said to me I could kill you right here and right now and sit here in the house with your body until your son comes home from school just so he could see the expression on my son's face when he finds my body and that split second it became crystal clear to me that I was in a fight for my life and that this man, it became crystal clear to me that this man was actually capable of killing me. All the other times that I had heard him say that he would do so but never follow through, that very moment it became crystal clear mm -hmm. that he was capable of doing it and that he did not care. He had no remorse for me or my kids. Right. And at that moment, I don't know why he let me go because I felt myself getting weak and leaning to fall right, off. Right, because you can't breathe. You don't, and you at don't that anything. moment, about 10 seconds mm -hmm. before I lost consciousness, he let me go. Right. And I just remember gasping for air and I just broke down and I just started crying because all I can say to him is why? Right. Oh my God. Like why? Like I just want to know why? And he had no answer for me. He looked at me, sitting on the toilet, and he just walked out the bathroom, went, and sat in the living room, mm -hmm. and watched TV like nothing had happened. Right. I closed the bathroom door, and I just cried to myself. I was so broken. Right. I was so hurt. I couldn't believe I was here again. Mm -hmm. And now this time, it was 20 times as worse. Right than what my husband mm -hmm. had done to me. Right. I thought he was going to kill me. And enduring all of that, I still never said anything. Wow. Yeah. I made my kids promise. The same things that my mother instilled in me, I found myself becoming my mother. And I said to my kids, Don't say anything. Don't say anything. I didn't want my mother to know whatever happens in my house, stay in my house. Mm -hmm. And they never said anything. And it wasn't until I had gotten out of that relationship and started to go to counseling that things became crystal clear to me. I realized my mistakes and I owned my truth. Mm -hmm. And I was wrong for what I told my kids to do. And I humbly apologized to them for that. Because I, have, I should have never told them to keep that secret. Because that secret Keeping that secret almost killed me. And if it was anything that I regret, it would be that. Right. I, know. I don't regret that I had gotten into those relationships because those relationships made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm an overcomer. Yes. So, uh -huh. you know, that would be the only regret that I had is that I, my kids had to see certain things that they should not have seen. They heard certain things that they should not have heard. And the fact that I made them promise not to tell anything. Mm -hmm. And because I said that, they never said anything. Right. So, I mean, how are your kids today? I know your, your son, it, it affected him really, really strongly as well. Yeah. Well, my daughter, although she, she's grown, she's married with two kids. Mm -hmm. So she didn't, you know, she wasn't with me. She stayed up here. Um, when I moved to Baltimore. So because my son was a minor, of course, he was with me. Um, with all of that that had, we've gone through, um, you know, he got counseling separately, and I did the sep counseling, and then we did the family counseling together. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of things that came out, mm -hmm. you know, that... I will only be able to disclose because 
of going to counseling. And so that really helped us a lot. I mean, with all of that, he maintained to stay in school and graduate high nice, school good, last year. Good. He's working right. two jobs now. Right. And he's going to school, part-time, college. Mm -hmm. So we're good. When you're in that situation, you're always in survival mode. So you, your mind is always... You know, you're in survival mode. You, sometimes you can't function clearly yeah. because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. You never know if today is your last day here. You never, you just never know. Right. And so there was things that I had pieced together before going there, you know, that I realized that my husband's behavior was actually learned behavior. Right. He had learned that behavior from his father because his father was an abuser right. of his mother. Um. His father actually died at 30, 31, and my husband died at 33. Wow. So. Wow. Okay. And they both basically died. At, well, his father died in the hospital of a heart attack, and my husband had an asthma attack and then went into cardiac arrest. So almost the same similar situation. The second abuser, I piece, put the, connected the dots, I realized that, he had woman issues before him and I had even gotten together. Right. He had woman issues way before his women issues stemmed from, um, you know, his mother had him when she was 14. Wow. And then she was an alcoholic. And then she didn't want him, so she had given him to his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And the grandmother really didn't want to be bothered with him, so he shuffled between two aunts. And then when he got up old enough to start to date women, every woman that came before me has cheated on him for one reason or another. Right. So he's trying to keep all of that backstory and luggage onto you and making absolutely. you punishing you for that. So I just got caught in some BS. You know, I just got caught in some BS wow. for all like you said, and basically he hadn't gotten over whatever things that had gone on in his past and Right. You know, he had already, I felt like I was already condemned hmm. from from the very beginning. Right, Like, right. I, he had no trust issues, so he never would have trusted me, mm -hmm. regardless to what I did, how far I went to try to prove to him that he, he was never going to be though. satisfied. Talk about that, because I think so often people who are being abused, you know, take on the responsibility of trying to stop their abuser from abusing them. Or let me, let me try to help you, you know, help me, you know what I mean? type away and is that even possible no it's not possible at right. all and I was actually there mm -hmm. I think I was clouded well I'm not going to say clouded but I think the fact that I actually did love this man and at some point I did realize that he was hurt mm -hmm. but it was a part of me that thought that I could love him past his pain. That if I could show this man that Melissa is not like every other woman he was with. If he could see that Melissa was not like, you know, Melissa does the cooking and she does the cleaning. And, you know, Melissa is faithful and Melissa is this and that and the third. And if I could show him that I love you for the you. And, I, and it was a part of me that felt that if I could show him, but he, then it was crystal clear that right. Melissa couldn't help him. Right. Because whatever was going on, his issues was much more, right. you know, what he was going through was so heavy, it was much more, I, there was nothing I can help him with. Right. He had to want to help himself before Melissa could even help him. And he needed to go get right for him. And he needed to let me go. So that I can do what was right for me. Right. Because he, me being caught up in whatever it is that he had going on was just making it worse. And although I guess a part of him, I would want to I would want to think that after being with someone for four years, that there was some love there. I would like to think that maybe it was just that he didn't know how to love because he was damaged. Damaged. 
Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I think after I went through my grieving period and had gotten over that hump with my husband, here I met him and he just put, I, I felt like I was in quicksand. Right. Right. You know, I felt like I was sinking quickly. <laughs> and right. I was like, like, I, I was stuck. Like, how do I get up out of this? Right. But and you found a way. You found a way to get out of it. Uh, yeah, I did. It wasn't what, how I had planned it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things just happen that you just have no control over. And although we try to plan as much as we can and we try to, you know, we try to follow the plan that we had enforced, it don't happen like that. Right. And unfortunately, that's what happened in this case. Although I was making plans to escape and get away and do what it, things had gotten really bad one mm -hmm. night before I had actually the date that I had actually planned for my son and I to escape, things had gotten really bad. And you just wound up leaving, just running out, taking your that suitcase you had unpacked, and then calling your son, and you had, and that was it. After, yeah, and after, that was it. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. talk about. I mean, that's incredible. Talk about now how you are helping others. You know, people who are also survivors of domestic violence. How did that come? About? Five years ago, after leaving that abusive relationship, mm -hmm. and I was thinking, I was like, you know, I know how I felt, especially not being able to tell anyone you feel like you're alone, and I know that there's others out there too. Mm -hmm. And so I figured out how to create this page on Facebook, this group, and so I came up with the name Love Shouldn't Hurt. Right. And so I figured it started out it's just a place to just to go be able to go and vent because like I said I hadn't told anyone so I'm just venting to myself I'm just right. speaking my thoughts out mm -hmm. and so it actually became therapeutic for me and so before I knew it I had these other people requesting to get in there and when they found out the nature of the group what the group was actually about right. you know I guess people was drawn to you know, the fact that it was domestic violence and there was a lot of people that could relate to what the situation was. People just started to feel comfortable and they started coming and sharing their own personal stories as well. And I was like, wow. And so I said, wow, I might be on to something here. So then it went from me discussing my personal what had happened to me just in a group. I started posting it on all the social media, on the Facebook just everywhere. And now you have thousands of followers, I understand. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And so I think when I became, you know, transparent about what had happened, I think people saw that it was okay not to be embarrassed. Like, to realize that, you know, these things that happened to you, it wasn't your fault. You know? And so when you become comfortable and you accept what had happened, and realize that it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. You could deal. And you can relate. Right. And you can understand. And you can sympathize with somebody. So I just started to you know, post. And people would come back and say. Wow. You know, I thought I was the only one that was going through this. And they're, and, they're, and, you're, and they're absolutely not. And that's what you're giving them. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. I actually want you before you go. You have something coming up very soon. A Pamper Me event. Just share with us what that is. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a shelter in Manhattan, mm -hmm. in Harlem, actually, mm -hmm. a domestic violence shelter. Um, I work closely. I went and introduced myself, and I got to know the directors and stuff there. So we have been communicating. And so um, she actually reached out to me, and they're putting on an event for the survivors there, you know, as a way to say, you know, kudos to you because you had the heart to leave. You know, you took a stand and you took right. your life That's back. Hard. So, uh, she reached out to me and she was telling me about this event. She actually asked me if I would come and speak at this event. And I said, awesome. So, I thought it would be a good idea because, you know, they don't get right. beautified and because of the situations that they're in. So, it's a lot of times that they don't get these things. 
I thought it would be a good idea if they would actually get this pamper day and then show up at the event later on that evening. So the event is actually happening from five to eight. Mm -hmm. So I have a beauty, I put this beauty team together. I reached out to some of my connections. So we're gonna have like two manicurists, two pedicurists, we have massages, wow, we have right. people that's coming to do makeup. And so they're actually gonna come there and they're gonna get them all dolled up for the event <laughs> later on that <laughs> evening. So everybody's hair and everything is gonna be looking nice. So it's, it's going to be awesome. That's happening um, October 16th. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Right. Lifestyle.